This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, episode 104. This week, um, well, hey, Bruce, there was an F-104, right? Yes, indeed, there was. The Lockheed F-104 was a Mach 2 capable interceptor that flew for dozens of countries for a long time, and in fact, some are still flying today. All right, well, that's good to know, Bruce, because last week we made the mistake with that on the F-103. So, all right, in this case, this week, it's all about the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter with former Canadian Armed Forces Captain Rob Fleck. It's going to be great. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Happy Valentine's Day, Fighter Pilot Podcast enthusiasts. I am your host, Jello, and I'll tell you what, Cupid has struck. I am in love with the F-104 Starfighter. Of course, I knew there was an F-104. Come on. Anyway, what an amazing aircraft. You're going to hear all about it in our feature interview with Flecko coming up in just a few minutes. But first, you know the drill. We've got to get through a few announcements, a handful of listener questions, and then our pal Bruce Gordon will be back along to help discuss the speedy Starfighter. And it really is. Mach 2, man, this thing is cool. Anyway, announcements. Let's see. Big kudos to the Air Force for the Super Bowl flyover. Thought that was very well done. I personally didn't particularly care about either of the teams, and one of them didn't really show up to play anyway. So I thought the flyover was the best part. And it kind of reminded me of our first bomber month way back in, what year was that, 19, I guess? We had the B-1, the B-2, and the B-52. All they were missing was the B-17. Not sure it could have kept up, but that would have been pretty cool. Let's see other announcements. Don't forget to check out our merchandise on the website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. We have right now some Century Series shirts that appear with their corresponding episodes. So today you can find the F-104 shirt, the F-101, 2, and 3, uh, let's see, 100, I guess, right? We fell into that trap last time. They're already all up there. And the F-105 and 106 will be out in the coming weeks. But yeah, go check them out. They are designed by our graphic designer guy, Yannick. He helps with a lot of things here on the show. And he put those together, and I think you'll like them. Let's see what else. So last week, we released a musing called Not Today. It chronicles my last few flights in the Navy, including what I thought would be my last flights in Fallon, and then came and took a tour down here in San Diego. Again, go over to fighterpilotpodcast.com, click on musings, and you can check those out. And feedback's been good, so I appreciate that. The other thing is we want to announce our BVR Productions Podcast Network. This is a collaborative group of military aviation shows. We're all agreeing to help each other out. And, you know, it's not like we are buying their shows or own them or anything else. It's more like a cartel, in a sense. We all help each other out and we can share resources if someone has a good guest or they're looking for a particular subject or something. I mean, we're helping uh, share our musicians and producers and everything. So it's just a cool way to help each other out. The Rising Tide lifts all the boats. And the shows that have showed up in order are the Low Level Hell podcast, Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer podcast, Harry, and the Afterburn podcast. And you've heard from all these guys, Casmo and Colin and Matt Graves and Rainwaters. They've all probably been here on the show before, and now you might hear from them more, and you might hear me over on their shows. But yeah, we're just going to help each other and collaborate, and it should be a lot of fun. All right, let's get to some questions. First one is an email from Josh Fagel who says, I recently read that in June 2017, U.S. Air Force F-15Es shot down two Iranian drones which makes me wonder, does shooting down a drone count as an air-to-air kill? What constitutes an air-to-air victory? Well, Josh, I don't know. I don't know if there is an authority on this, but if you're asking my opinion, and apparently you are since you sent that to me, I would say no, it doesn't count. Now, yeah, I mean, the F-15 crew here employed ordnance that took down another flying thing. But unless there is somebody in the cockpit flying that thing, not just flying it remotely, I don't think any self-respecting fighter pilot in Wizzo and an F-15E would count that as a air-to-air victory. And if they did that five times, would call themselves an ace. I think it should be mano y mano and whatever the female version of that is. So anyway, that's just my opinion. Next, let's take a phone call. Hi, Jello. This is Gabriel Brown. I'm from South Alabama, Mobile, Alabama to be exact. I have a question about qualifying for flight, mainly for military aviation. I'm a senior at the University of South Alabama, 
and I'm also a cadet in the commissioning program at South Alabama, and I've been selected to go to pilot training for the United States Air Force next year. My question is, I just finished up my flight physical up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. I've heard rumors about flying for the Navy and flying for the Air Force and what's fundamentally different about them as far as qualifying as a pilot go in each branch. And I was just wondering, why is it that in the Air Force we have such strict requirements that we have to meet, like for vision and hearing? Because I've heard that, you know, some friends of mine who washed out because of these barriers with medical qualifying, they were not, you know, allowed to fly for the Air Force, but they were able to get picked up by the Navy, you know, almost immediately. I'm not saying anything against, you know, Navy flying, but I really do want to know why is it that we have such strict parameters in the Air Force and, you know, in the Navy, it's not as strict. I guess my biggest example would be measuring the cornea inside the eye. Like the Air Force will disqualify you if your cornea is not thick enough or curved enough, whereas in the Navy, I'm pretty sure they don't have this requirement. Thanks, Jello. All right, Gabriel. Well, boy, you guys are really hitting me with the good ones today because, again, I don't really know. This is not my area of specialty. My guess is that different groups of professionals in the same field just came to different conclusions on what's qualifying or disqualifying. And maybe it's based on their own personal bents or information. And maybe it's just something that they arrived at. Like if you walk up to something where there's six items on the table, you might say, hey, look, there's six. And I might say, what are you talking about? There's a half a dozen. Now, granted, you're talking about the cornea dimensions and different things. And Again, if someone out there has better information, please let me know and I can circle back to this. Otherwise, I mean, think about it, right? Our F-102 guest said he was, quote, a little colorblind or whatever it was. And yet everyone agrees that colorblindness is disqualifying, no doubt about it. And yet sounds like he had a perfectly good career and flew just fine. So I don't know how they come to it and why it's different in some services and whether it needs to be aligned and why it's not. These are all good questions, Gabriel, and uh, you got me on that one. All right, now an email from Cameron Wright in the Atlanta, Georgia area. It says, if you had to do it all over again, would you have flown other types of aircraft in addition to the Hornet? Oh, finally, thank you, Cameron. A question I can answer. Well, sure, I would love to fly just about everything, and I tried. I flew in the front seat of an E-2 Hawkeye and the back seat of an EA-6B Prowler. Tried to get a flight in the back of the F-5F Tiger II, but didn't quite work out. So yeah, I would have loved to have flown the F-14 at some point. I think I mentioned on the show that I asked about that when I got to Top Gun because the F-14 guys all got to fly the Hornet and they laughed at me and said, no, you need experience in that thing. When it comes right down to it, I wouldn't go back and change what I did. I'm glad I flew the Hornet from the beginning. I feel like I learned it very well and achieved 3000 hours in it, which I might not have done if I'd started in something else. So yeah, I'd love to fly everything, but I'm glad I, I stuck with the Hornet. All right, another phone call. Hello, this is Carver Bullman calling in from Kirbyville, Missouri. I have a question about the Air National Guard. For the Air National Guard to fly for them, do you have to serve active duty first, or is it something where you can go straight from civilian life to joining the Air National Guard and learning how to fly? That's basically my question. Thanks for the podcast. Really appreciate it. All right. Yes, Mr. Bowman, you can go straight from the street to the seat in the Air National Guard. In fact, if you remember episode 99, our guest on the E-2 Hawkeye was Jonathan Ulbricht and his son, Liam, who is a friend of the show. He helps us with some stuff, actually. He is going from the street to an F-35 guard unit, and he starts in the summer of 2021. So our best hopes for him on good training. And yeah, Cadre, you can definitely go from the street to the seat in an Air National Guard unit. All right, next up is an email from Tom with the introduction of Gen 5 single-seat only fighters and the future retirement of twin-seat Gen 4 fighters. Is the software user interface and integration at a point where one pilot can fully replace the need of a WISO without any drop in capacity or capability? Well, this is a trick question, Tom, in a sense, because... The short answer is yes. The technology is there. The integration is there that one pilot can operate, for example, the F-35, and I have not flown it, but from what I understand, it's extremely capable and very situational awareness enhancing to the pilot. That being said, I was single seat most of my career and finally started flying with a WIZO when I was the operations officer at the weapons school towards the end of my flying tactical career. And I really enjoyed it. I see the value in having a WIZO. I remember one distinct air-to-air -air intercept I was doing, and I turned to go do something away from the threat, 
And usually I'm doing that on my own. And so I have to piece everything together. And I looked down at my situational awareness display and Steiny Acevedo, who was in my back seat, had it already set the way I needed it. He even gave me a little ICS sugar call. And man, did my awareness go up a lot. And so, of course, the Navy also likes the two-seat roll, or I should say the FAC-A, Ford Air Controller Airborne roll to be done by two-seaters. Air Force will do that single seat. But so, yeah, I mean, yes, the technology is there, but I still see value in some squadrons, maybe not every squadron in the air wing, but some to have a second crew member because there are some tasks and chores that are just a little bit busier. Sometimes it's good to have someone in the back. All right, let's finish up then with a phone call from Rich. Hey, Jello, uh, Rich Collin here from the great state of New York. Thank you so much for putting together such a quality, educational, and interesting program. It's literally the highlight of my week every time I get to hear a new episode. My question is, on a lot of your podcasts, I hear both yourself and your guests talk about landing heavy on the aircraft carrier. And in order to avoid doing so, you end up expelling ordnance into the sea. My question is, Has the Navy ever come up with a program, let's call it, I don't know, a taxpayer asset mitigation program? This is the first time you're hearing of it. Don't forget, this is my idea. (laughs) But I mean, a floating net in the sea that can be picked up afterwards by a helicopter, something to collect that ordinance and sort of uh, save money in the grand scheme of things. But hey, thanks again for everything that you do. Thank you for your service. And thank you for the service to every uh, guest that you have on here. And uh, cheers to many more podcasts. All right, Rich. Well, first off, uh, you're one of those folks in New York. I hope I didn't upset when I said I didn't want to go there. And again, uh, you know, my airline is trying to get me to commute to a base there in New York City, which is fine if I didn't live in San Diego all the way across the country. And so, yeah, I don't mind visiting. I spent some time in Albany. Not sure where you are, Rich, but I don't mind it there. I just don't want to fly five hours each way just to start a rotation. So I'm still on the bench for now and I'll keep you all posted on what goes on with that. Anyway, I think your idea is an interesting one, but I don't think it's very practical for a couple reasons. Number one, salt water is extremely corrosive. So anytime a weapon lands in the water, I mean, yeah, the warhead itself is probably going to be fine, but all the components on it, the fuses, the different electronics and the fins, anything that maybe opens, they're not going to do well. Secondly, anytime you have something super heavy hitting something on the water, like with a net, it's going to pull it down. And so you're going to need a pretty strong contraption to keep that from happening and what ships or aircraft or whatever are going to keep that going. The cost benefit of this, I don't see it being practical. It's a lot of effort. And frankly, bombs are not that expensive. I mean, yeah, you have to replenish if you drop them enough, but you know, it's probably not worth it. It's an interesting idea, but uh, I don't see it happening. All right. Well, thanks for the questions. As always, we're starting to burn through those. So if you have a question for the show, you can submit it via email questions, plural at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line. And the number for that is in our closing announcement at the end of the show. And we can't get through the century series episodes without Bruce Gordon's help. And sure enough, he's back to help out this week. How's it going, Bruce? It's going great. Excellent. Well, you know, last week's F-100 discussion was a lot of fun, and several listeners later pointed out that we didn't mention there are still a few of these birds flying around today. Yeah, there are some flying in air shows, but not in combat units. No, of course. That's been gone a long time. But all right, well, never mind the F-100. Next up is the F-104 Starfighter, and you had a chance to preview the interview with Flecko. Any thoughts before we get to it? I loved his presentation. And things I'd like you to listen to as you go through it is speed. Listen to his speed because I'll be following up on that after the interview. All right. Outstanding. Well, let's get to it then with Rob Fleck, Flecko, all about the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. Here we go. All right, the Century Series continues, and today we are talking about the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, and we have Rob Fleck, call sign Flecko. He is formerly a captain in the Canadian Armed Forces. He's dialing in from, actually, I don't know where you are, Rob. Where are you? I'm in Ottawa, where it's quite snowy today, Ottawa, Canada. All right, well, hey, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much for having me on. 
All right, well, we're going to talk all about the F-104 Starfighter and your experiences in it. But first, let's get to know you. Um, where are you from? Are you from Ottawa? And tell us about where you went to school and then a little bit about your military experiences. Oh, yeah, very good. Uh, born in Ottawa, one of those guys that always had model airplanes and all sorts of crazy things building. Knew I wanted to fly, wasn't sure how to do it. In Canada, there's a plethora of avenues, and the avenue I chose was through the Canadian Armed Forces. So they give you an education, teach you how to fly, give you some free clothes, feed and water you, and I couldn't think of a better way to go. Join the Canadian Armed Forces, go through all their academics, all their training, and after basic flying training where you get your wings, I was very, very fortunate. I flew the CF-5, which is the Canadian version of the F-5, and that was our fighter lead-in aircraft. And then from there, I was very, very lucky that I was selected one of the few guys to fly the CF-104 Starfighter, the C being for Canada. So the F-104 Starfighter, and uh, Canada at the time was using those aircraft to fulfill its NATO commitment in Germany. So I was um, qualified on the F-104 in Cold Lake, Alberta. Good name for the place. It's pretty cold there in the winter. Mm -hmm. And packed up and sent me over to Germany, and that's where I did all my flying. Uh, after the 104, I was selected to be initial cadre, an instructor on the F-18, and I retired from the Canadian Armed Forces as an F-18 instructor. Oh, outstanding. You've got quite the experience base then, and also, I would imagine, some changes between the technology of the F-104 and the F-18, and that's my aircraft, so I can hopefully draw some parallels there with you. Oh, very good. Just out of curiosity, how many hours did you end up with in the Hornet? Oh, on the Hornet, about 930 hours total in the Hornet. Oh. Almost exactly what I got on the 104. Oh, okay. Great. Well, let's jump into the F-104. And as has been the case with the Century Series, this is, again, one of those aircraft I don't know a whole lot about. And I'm happy to have this podcast because, frankly, I learn a lot and hopefully the listeners do too. I do recall seeing, it's been probably at least 10 years, but I think TRW or some company was flying them at air shows for a while. Some really pretty blue ones, at least here in the States. I don't know if they made their way up north. but And I think there's still an organization down in Florida, Starfighters, that flies them. But let's start at the beginning. What can you tell us about how the F-104 came to be? Right. So we're, we're going to go all the way back to early 50s Korean War. Remember in the Korean War, F-86 sort of was the king of the castle. That's right. Um, but they're still flying Mustangs and whatnot in the Korean War. Corsairs. Corsair, yeah, for sure, Corsairs. So what happens is Kelly Johnson, the famous SR-71 T-38U-2 skunk works from Lockheed, he interviewed a lot of F-86 pilots that were coming back from Korea to find out what they wanted. Obviously, Kelly working for Lockheed wanted to get the jump on uh, designing a new fighter aircraft. And it seemed to come back that all the fighter pilots wanted something simple, lightweight, but the underlying theme was speed. <laughs> so you give a guy like Kelly Johnson an idea that pilots want to go fast, and then you marry it up with a brand new engine, a J-79 afterburning engine. So Kelly sits down. You know what an incredible mind comes out of that skunk works ideas and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So Kelly sits down and he designs the 104 around the J-79 engine. The idea is let's go fast. <laughs> so the airplane is an easy Mach 2 airplane. The only tiny thing is it doesn't turn. So the airplane is about a 28,000 pound airplane and the little tiny wings out back, they're only seven feet, 11 inches each wing for a 28 foot wingspan. The fuselage is about 55 feet long, but it went fast. And so Kelly delivered on this lightweight Fairly easy to build, single engine, really fast airplane. Initially, the U.S. Air Force wasn't very happy with it. It did have some limited combat experience. They were trying to use it as an air interceptor. So you get this. The initial ejection seats went down. So the idea was, oh, you're bombing along at high altitude. You have a problem. We want to get the pilot down into the thick air where you can survive. So let's eject them down. So that was a really abstract idea and not all of Kelly's ideas really worked well. So early on downward ejection seats, all the later versions all have a traditional upward ejection seat. Thank goodness. Um, the aircraft did not find much favor with the U.S. Uh, Air Force, but what it did find favor 
was with NATO. So mm. looking for a way to step out of the F-86 type era and step into a fast, high-performance aircraft that was cheap and could be built under license. The F-104, it was a phenomenal success for NATO in Europe as far as Lockheed was concerned with sales. One of the things that happened in Canada is we were trying to figure out what to do after our F-86 era was over, and we selected the F-104 in 1959. So by this stage, uh, the airplane first flight was 54, so the airplane is only five years old, doesn't have many sales. Canada selects it as its NATO aircraft for Europe, and they were Canadian and a lot of Dutch and Norwegian and other countries in NATO. These aircraft are built in Canada. So the Canadian F-104 was a G model 104, which is called G model. If there's a, a standard issue 104, it's the G model. Okay. And in Canada, we did things just a little different. The airplane comes equipped normally with an M61 Gatling gun. Initially, we pulled that M61 out of there and put another fuel tank in there to give the airplane about an extra 750 pounds of fuel. The idea was we were going to deploy these aircraft in a strike reconnaissance role, as strike as a nuclear strike and with a camera pod underneath for reconnaissance. Uh -huh. The airplane was fantastic in this role as a tactical, not strategic. Strike aircraft is extremely fast. Working on your own, you can get very low. It could deliver tactical nukes very, very efficiently. And also in the recce as a unarmed and unafraid model. Remember, we don't have an M61 in the aircraft at this stage. The aircraft was also a very good recce platform. And most of the other NATO countries, they did not run this way. They left the M61 in the aircraft for air defense. Well, let me jump in, Rob, because we've covered so much already, which is wonderful. And these are all topics I want to ask you about, the performance, the weapons, the way it looks, and all that. And it does remind me, when you talked about going fast but not turning, that the air show that I mentioned where I saw the blue F-104s, that was, I think, what they did was, okay, now from the left. Okay, now from the right. You know, it didn't do like the high alpha pass you might have done in F-18 if you were the demo pilot or the min radius turn and all that. So it really was what people thought they wanted, but sometimes I don't think consumers know what they want. But so for the G model, was there a bread and butter role, at least in your experiences and your near a thousand hours flying it that, okay, we're going to go do air to air or we're going to do air interdiction or reconnaissance? What was the bread and butter role when you flew it, Rob? Before my time, the bread and butter was strike with a backup of recce okay. and a tertiary role of air-to-air. -air. The aircraft did carry the Sidewinder, the early versions of the Sidewinder, and it did have an air-to-air -air radar, pretty rudiment, but it was not an ACM, not an air combat maneuvering type airplane. No, I wouldn't think. It was really a shoot-and-forget type aircraft. So my observations of most NATO countries is they ended up having the air-to-air -air mode they really dumbed that down and the aircraft drifted down low and became a uh, tactical strike, recce, and then later, and that's when I entered a conventional weapon, low-level conventional weapon delivery. It sort of takes the whole state of Texas to get the darn thing turned around. So, you know, <laughs> Vincent, you flew F-18s, you know, I can't remember right now. Do a loop, a uh, min rate loop, maybe 1,500 feet. The 104, its worst loop, 550 knot entry speed, 5G pull, no flaps. That was a 14,000 foot endeavor just to try and <laughs> 10 times, 10 times the radius. Wow. Not a great air fighter, not a great ACM machine. Its other attributes, low, low level helped it, but yeah. boy, oh boy, oh boy. You know, the only thing you could do was a, a hag, a high angle gunshot. And that was sort of in air to air. You'd drive through a big, furball a guy's fighting and you just hope somebody drifted in front of you and you took a shot at them and then you exited the furball the other side slashing attack yeah 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 the high angle gunshot that was our specialty okay air to air and you just hoped somebody got in front of you <laughs> oh that's crazy yeah i mean again if you give people what they want they might not be able to do everything they want to do with it and so they got the fast 
fighter that they wanted. And it certainly had some speed and altitude records as we'll get to, I hope in a little bit, but yeah, not going to do well in the phone booth, as we say, the turning dogfight. So of all the variants, did you only fly? So there was some obviously prototypes and A through F, it looks like, and then you flew the G. Did you ever fly anything later than that as well? No, no. And uh, I might've mentioned this already. The aircraft that I actually flew was the CF. 104, which was a G with some modifications done. Okay. All those earlier variants, by the time I realized what was going on in life, probably uh, public school, high school, all those earlier variants were starting to be phased out, except for a few National Guards. So okay. the G was the popular version. Gotcha. Okay. And I think it went as high as the S. And, you know, people can read about that. I've been advised that, hey, we don't need facts. We can read about that on Wikipedia. We want the stories. So that's why you're here, Flecko. <laughs> Very good. So the CF-104, I believe, also had a D model that was for trainer. Is that correct? Yes, those were built by Lockheed. I, geez, I just don't remember how many we had. There would have been a slew of them at the OTU, the Operational Training Unit, or where you learn to fly the airplane. That was in Canada. Right. And then over in Europe, each squadron had one duel, and we did the traditional things mm-hmm. in the duel. we take limited combat-ready guys and bring them up to combat-ready status. We'd do instrument training in the duel. The duel was a um, bit of an odd duck. So the J-79 swallowed up a lot of gas. Mm-hmm. The poor old duel only had 4,400 internal pounds of fuel. Oh, my. So in order to do anything with it, you had to hang gas tanks all over the place, which really messed up the performance of the aircraft. Most aircraft carry most of the fuel in the wings. Was the F-104 that way? Were they wet wings? Yeah, so pretty cool. Again, the Kelly Johnson brain shows up. Uh-huh. The wing is machined out of one hunk of aluminum, and I should know the answer to this, but it's probably no thicker than a few inches. And the leading edge is really, really sharp. So there's no place to put gas in the 104. And on as a tangent to that, there's not a 104 pilot out there that doesn't have a big gash in their head from doing the walk around, <laughs> bending down to look at the landing gear and slicing their forehead or their scalp open on the leading edge. It was razor razor sharp so all its gas has to be carried in the fuselage if you can visualize the 104 the gas is sort of behind the pilot and and in front of the engine that's where all its internal fuel is yeah now traditionally the cool look of the 104 is because it had tip tanks if memory serves me there's 11 to 1200 pounds in each tip tank of fuel and that was a normal configuration for the 104 is to have tip tanks internal fuel That's kind of the, um, when you see the pictures of them, when you see them flying around, if uh, people have a memory of what a 104 looks like, it's got those lovely tip tanks. It needs those tip tanks to go anywhere. Well, I read that unlike some aircraft like the T2 Buckeye I flew in training, the tip tanks on the F-104 could be taken off and you could maybe put something else on, like missiles. That's where the sidewinders went on the rails on the tip tank. So and then the Canadian version did not have sidewinders, but on the G model, most of the sidewinders were carried on on the tip tank. So this is a bit of a um, wind the clock back to Battle of Britain, Spitfire Hurricane days, take off, go shoot down airplanes, land right away where you started from. That's one of the only ways you could really carry a lot of air-to-air armament is leave the tip tanks behind and put weapons out there on the tips. And of course, you sacrifice the fuel. So, all right, that makes sense. Yeah, it's <laughs> huge. Everything is trade-off in light, right, Rob? Nothing's free. That's right. All right. So obviously the U.S. and Canada, who else flew the Starfighter? Well, in my day, um, most of the um, NATO countries flew the Starfighter at one time or another, not the United Kingdom. Okay. But the Norwegians had Starfighters, obviously the Danes, the Belgians, the Dutch, not the French, but they weren't quite in NATO. They were only a toll in the NATO program. The Germans had a very big starfighter program, and unfortunately, they had an awful lot of fatalities. Yeah. The Italians, they flew the S model right to the very end, I believe. Yep. The Greeks had 104s, and the Turks had 104s, and I probably left somebody out. It was a very prolific airplane, yes. late 70s, early 80s in NATO. Curious based on its performance, but I suppose some of that was perhaps the posturing of Lockheed. And there was, I read a little bit of hubbub about was there some nefarious activities to get countries to buy the F 104. But no, the only other one I read that you didn't cover was Japan, I guess. Oh, right. Sorry. My focus was uh, NATO. But yes, uh, the Japanese had some success with the F 104. I think politically, you know, it's a cool looking airplane, it goes really fast. I think politicians couldn't wave a banner saying we bought this really high performance, cool airplane. 
I'm not sure what we're going to do with it. It stimulates R&D. There's technology transfer naturally with an aircraft. There's commonality right. with an aircraft. Everybody's running the same airplane. So with some limitations, you know, you break down in Norway with your 104. Someone's going to run over with parts and know how to fix it. So I think that NATO commonality really worked in Lockheed's favor to sell a lot of those airplanes. Well, and as we think about the design of the aircraft, uh, sometimes we'll ask our guests, why does it look the way it does? And I think we've probably already answered this with your discussion at the top, which was, look, Kelly Johnson said, you guys want something to go fast. So let me put a skin around an engine and some stubby wings. And here you go. I mean, it's got a high T tail, but not much else to it, is there? No, no. And it's a really cool airplane when you don't see them very often flying without any tip tanks on them, but the anhedral or the downward pointing wings, again, good idea from Kelly Johnson. Unfortunately, it caused stability problems, but it's a very, very iconic looking airplane. You know, it's really hard sometimes to tell a T-38 from an F-5. There's no doubt when you see a 104 that that's a 104. It really stands out. Yeah. Was it difficult to pick up visually? Of course, it's going to come by so quickly, maybe it didn't matter. But I would think head-on, a lot like an F-16, this might be a very difficult aircraft to get a tally on, as we'd say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what? Skin to skin, head-on pass, really tiny visual cross-section. Mm. And to make matters worse, really small radar cross-section. Oh. So you've got an aircraft going really, really fast. If he's coming head-on, it's really hard for the radars of the day to pick up the 104 until it was a little bit too late. Now the 104, if you're going to meet him head on, he's not going to turn with you. He's just going to keep going. Right. But you may have lost your window to take a missile shot at him. Right. The really small visual. The one problem that the aircraft had was the J-79 older technology engine. It smoked when it was in military power, i.e. not after burning. A bit like the Phantoms with the J-79. You could just follow the black smoke trail and find a little dot out front of it. The 104 suffered from that same phenomena just like the J-79 and the Phantom. When the J-79 and the 104 was after burning, it was clean. Mm. But in military power, quite a lot of black smoke. So in, a, in the right environment, we'll say over a snow-covered Bavaria, unfortunately, it was really easy to find the 104. Yeah. Okay. So with that design, did I read that the landing gear comes out of the fuselage? I'm guessing there's no room in those wings. So I wonder, <laughs> just kind of jumping ahead to performance, what was it like to fly? Was it a joy or was it a a pain and did the landing gear make it challenging on takeoffs and landings? Well, first of all, landing gear. Again, with the Kelly Johnson idea, there's nothing you can, in those days, I'm sure, stump Kelly on. You give him a problem <laughs> and he's going to come up with a solution. And the problem was where do you put the wheels on this airplane? The landing gear does a lot of twisting and turning to get itself in the belly. A lot like an Avanti Piaggio, it's a pusher civilian airplane with two PT6s on it. The wheels do a lot of turning and rotating to go up and tuck into the fuselage. The nose gear, which is good, on the single seat 104, the nose gear went aft. It rotated aft, sort of, and ended up underneath about where the pilot's feet would be. On the two seat version, to make room for the extra cockpit, the nose gear went forward. Hmm. So it rotated and pivoted up underneath the ray dome. That was a huge problem flying it in Cold Lake, Alberta in the wintertime to try and get the wheels up before you oversped the 260 knot speed limit. And then you'd get a hung nose landing gear. Mm. What techniques a lot of guys used, can't admit that I did it, but it works. <laughs> once you rotate, you use the down lock override. And once you've rotated the aircraft in the nose up attitude on takeoff, you'd actually start the wheels coming up. So that as the weight came off the wheels, the landing gear would already start to close so you wouldn't overspeed it especially on the dual and especially at minus 20 or 30 degree weather where you got that phenomenal performance mm -hmm. it was really really easy to overspeed the dual the two-seater the f-104d in cold weather on the landing gear yeah it's normal right with an airplane you got to find places for all this stuff if you want this skinny little tube with an engine in it you got to find a home for the gas and you got to find a home for the wheels and you have to make compromises Oh, no doubt about it. And that's what's fun about, by the way, just having this century series that we're doing here on the aptly numbered episodes of the Fighter Pilot Podcast is the uh, previous episode we had on the F-101 with your countryman, Stace, he talked about the very same problem with the voodoo. And that was that if you weren't careful, if you tried to raise your gear too early, then of course you could settle back onto the runway and that could be a problem. But if you didn't, then you could end up 
over speeding. And then he talked about one pilot who had a habit of pulling the throttle to idle to make sure he didn't overspeed, but then they had a problem and ended up unfortunately crashing and killing themselves. But it's uh, one of those things where, uh, as you said, everything is a compromise and a trade-off. And my guess is it within the ready room, you guys had your best practices or even perhaps requirements for, Hey, take off and modulate your throttle or set this attitude or something to try to mitigate that from happening. Yeah, you bet. Now, things changed when you started loading weapons on the aircraft. Mm. And in my day, we loaded a lot of conventional weapons on the aircraft and made the aircraft very heavy. In an operational point of view, and of course, this comes a little bit with a lot of time in the aircraft, in an operational setting where the guys are all qualified on the aircraft, fly it all the time, you load the aircraft up with a lot of weapons. You like the afterburner, you trundle down the runway and you think, gee, uh, when I come home tonight, I better bring some milk home and some bread. And then you rotate the airplane and you're thinking, I better put some gas in the car because it's getting kind of low. And then you raise the landing gear. I'm talking fighter pilot leisure here, right. but it's a different monster when you load it up. And like most of these old straight turbojets, air density was a big deal. So on a really, really hot day loaded up with weapons, it's not the same you got to get the gear up right away as it would be in a training environment where the weather is really cold and you have lots of thrust. Once the airplane gets airborne and you get climbing away, it's an absolute dream to fly. There's a very, very famous Hemingway poem about if you lose your virginity to a fighter aircraft, it's going to be where your heart stays forever. I don't think there's a 104 pilot. Even the guys that went on to fly F-18s or exchange jobs flying F-15s or 14s or 16s, everybody's heart stayed with the 104 because of the raw power and speed. There was just something that always kept you excited. The speed, every single 104 pilot in Canada went Mach 2. That was uh, early on. I think your second, third solo trip in the aircraft, you took off, uh, you went Mach 2, out of gas, come back around and land. And the aircraft was an absolute dream supersonic. Unfortunately, we never really flew the airplane operationally supersonic. That was when you're only running away from somebody at Nellis on a red flag. <laughs> Down low, you could speed her up to any time you wanted. You'd go 750 knots, uh, not indicated airspeed, but equivalent airspeed. Not sure why they use that as our limit. You could wind her up to 750 knots and it'd do it, and it'd do it low. Because it wouldn't turn, it was very, very stable down low. But the problem is we spent most of our time at 450 knots down low, where you had to treat the airplane with some respect. It didn't turn. Um, it was easy to get boundary layer to separate in a tight turn. It would bleed off its energy just because of the phenomenal wing loading, way over 100 pounds a square foot. Mm -hmm. So it was an aircraft that demanded respect in the regime that we flew it in. But boy, you get her supersonic. It's fantastic. It flew nicer than the F-18 supersonic. Oh, wow. Well, that does say something. When you did, if you did, depart, was it fairly forgiving? I would think with that aircraft uh, design, it probably isn't. But what was it like in the post-all? Yeah, so there's a good one. <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at the CF-104 checklist that they gave me a long time ago. And the first 15 pages are eject, 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 eject. Doesn't matter what's going on, eject. <laughs> In other words, the checklist is for those who are initiated. If this happens, and what you're saying is the answer is eject. Yeah, so I'll just flip her open because I'm looking at it right now. Uh, critical emergency, ejection, afterburner blowout, eject. Tire failure, <laughs> you stay on the runway. Emergency go around, eject. Stall clearing, eject. Uh, nozzle opens on takeoff, eject. Like that was a common theme on the aircraft. So departing controlled flight. Wow. That was very, very unforgiving. The classic, um, Stace may have mentioned it in the voodoo, but the classic with all these old century T-tail airplanes, you get such a high angle of attack that the main wings blanket the T-tail and then you lose control of the aircraft. Right. Pull drag chutes, to try and get yourself out of a spin. There's a bunch of things you can do. As I recall, if you weren't sorted out in some kind of controlled flight by about 18,000 feet, you had no chance of recovering. Wow. Out the door you go. And the problem would be, let's say you get yourself out of a spin at 18,000 feet, you've got altimeter lag, that's a problem. Uh -huh. But you've also got to get the nose down, get some wind over those tiny little wings, get them flying again, right. and then pull out. So it was very, 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 very unforgiving. Yeah. One of my friends, Dave Geislinks, did a uh, traditional depart controlled flight, tried to save it, he got out. 
And obviously that's an airframe that's gone and we try and stay out of that world. But Dave's story was a little bit more of, um, wow, I sort of didn't see this coming. I was a little bit at altitude, pulling some G, the speed bled down just a little bit. That was it, gone. Well, 18,000 feet, for those who aren't aware, when you and I, Rob, flew the uh, F-18, it was 6,000 feet. I don't know if, if you had it at that. It was 10,000 for a while, <laughs> then we lowered it to six. So that's three times as high. And again, it's a completely different airframe, sure, but that just, for me, just puts it in perspective, and that's really crazy to think about. So, All right, so clearly high and fast. I think you said earlier five and a half Gs. Was that its peak, or could you pull more than that? Well, for some reason, all the airplanes that I flew in Canada, except for the F-18, all had a 7.33 G limit. Mm. And the F-104, that was its maximum G limit in a clean configuration. When we had tip tanks on, I'm thinking it's five or just a little over five G was the maximum G we could pull. So when you're going really fast, five G is not actually doing much turning and radius for you. Right. So I'll turn this around instead of it being a negative i tell you what was a huge positive is when you're really down low, assuming the terrain is fairly flat, the airplane is extremely stable. So the tiny little wings, the turbulence doesn't bother it. Down at 100 feet, you could leave the nose sort of pointed where it is so you wouldn't hit the ground. Look down quickly at a map, look back out. I'm talking a few milliseconds down. You'd feel very comfortable. And because of its stability, it's very high wing loading, the aircraft was a delight to fly low and a delight to fly low and fast that's really all the 104 pilots that i know most of them it's down low where they can all tell you that the airplane shines that's the sweet spot all right so i have to ask you then what was the fastest ground speed or maybe true air speed or whatever speed you want to use i know you've been over mach 2 because you said everyone did that but what do you remember seeing for knots over the ground well, I don't remember knots over the ground, but on red flags and maple flags, I'd be up towards 750 knots indicated, running away from people. Mm. Um, didn't really look at the ground speed. When you debrief, if somebody was to take a sidewinder shot at you, the little sidewinder missile didn't have the um, kinematics to catch up to you. <laughs> so I hate to say, you know, most fighter pilots want to turn around and fight. Uh, 104, you could run away pretty efficiently uh, because sure. of that speed. The one big thing that happened, though, is the fuselage heated up down at a few hundred feet going that fast. Uh, so much so that on a hot day, if you didn't have winter flying clothes on and whatnot, I won't say you'd burn yourself, but you'd leave a scar just putting your bare arm against the canopy rail when you're out running away from somebody. Wow. So there's other things going on there when you're going that fast down low. Besides our feathered friends, it's very inappropriate if you bump into one of those guys going 750 knots. Yes. All right. So in other words, in a party, I can tell the former F-104 pilots because of the burned forearms and the scars on their foreheads. The scars on the foreheads, the dead giveaway. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. So we, uh, on my little list here, as I check off, as we go along, we kind of jumped over the weapons, but I think we already covered them. So let me see if I did my homework here, uh, Rob, we talked about the M61 and as I read, it was the first aircraft to be equipped with that. Although you guys pulled them out. And then the AIM-9, and then later versions, the F-104C and beyond had air to ground. So bombs and rockets and even nukes. Yeah, you bet. So it's interesting. The Canadians, when we stopped the nuke roll, we put the M-61s back in and they were uh, electrically driven M-61s versus the hydraulic one that we had in the F-18. Right. But the same awesome 20 millimeter firepower. When the nuke roll wound down for Canada and we reconfigured the aircraft to conventional air to ground. Well, we carried a myriad of things. One of the neat weapons we carried, everybody had 2.75 inch rockets. It's a dumb oh, yeah. rocket. You just fire the things and they go away. But the Canadians invented something called a CRV-7, Canadian Rocket Vehicle 7. And these things were up over Mach 3, a little bit like the big gun on the A-10. It was all about kinetics. Yeah. And so we tried and tried and tried to put various warheads, but the warheads would be annihilated when they hit anything. And then we realized that either the spent plutonium idea or just leave it an inert head on it and it'll, through kinetics, it'll do way more damage than any other conventional rocket. The other neat thing about these CRV-7s is you could fire them at 18,000 feet. So three miles out, you could fire these babies off 
and run away. Wow. We became addicted, might almost be the word, when you were thinking about weapons. We had JMEMS, the Joint Munitions Effectiveness Manual. Yeah. When you look at the JMEMS, you'd say, what would I need to attack this theoretical target, a, um, a bridge, whatever, uh, takes 10 trillion bombs, by the way. CRV-7s, they do a lot of damage. The traditional NATO hangarettes got 24 inches of reinforced concrete and steel. These things would easily go through all that stuff. So oh, wow. although we had the traditional stuff, early on we had napalm, which turns out is not that effective. We had the traditional Mark 82s. That's a dumb bomb. Mm-hmm. Because of how we delivered them down at 200 feet, and we used the snake eye version or the high drag version. We had a cluster bomb that we used, a, a BL-755, a British cluster bomb. Seems to me all the weapons exam was 147 little mini bomblets in it. <laughs> but these CRV-7 things, these rockets, they were yeah. really effective and they would be almost my weapon of choice when you're planning a mission. Wow. I think it speaks also to the aircraft because my guess is, although maybe it's not, would you say that was your weapon of choice in the F-18? I don't know if you carried that in the F-18. Well, by the time we got to the F-18, not only do we still have these CRV-7s, but then we started to get smart weapons, which are designate, drop and forget, right. w- way better technology, right? Oh, yeah. And remember in the 104 day, we really just had a, um, it was a slightly compensated, but an iron sight. So hmm. it was really hard to get the skill set um, when a lot of things are going on to drop weapons accurately, even in the academic bombing ranges. So I must admit, though, I love the 104 for a weapons platform. The F-18 was a thousand generations further along as far as doing the job. Well, and I think a lot of that is the human to aircraft interface as well. In fact, I forgot to ask you, uh, you know, obviously the F-18 multiple displays and uh, the heads up display. What did the F-104 have going for it? It had a speedometer and it had an attitude indicator And it had a very rude combining glass with a gun sight on it. Later on, we got an inertial navigator. We didn't have a radar altimeter. We flew at low level. That's kind of silly. It was a pretty basic airplane. And maybe that's part of the allure or the mystique. There's something about a basic airplane that makes you honest. Oh, I agree. Well, it makes you a better pilot, I think, too, because it's less forgiving. I use sometimes on the show the example of drivers who rely on oversteer protection and analog brakes and various things. And it's safer, yes, but maybe you're not a better driver. And by the way, I did want to at least touch on the point you made about your first love, because again, Stace and I talked about that back on the F-101. I opined at the time that I think part of it is that when you first get to that first one, you are more inclined to say, I'm here, I've arrived. And so there's an experiential part of it that you've been working for for so long. And so obviously I think the first one, it makes sense. First kiss, first dance, whatever parallel you want to draw, but it's memorable, no doubt. All right. So as we think about the strengths and the weaknesses of the F-104, and and this is always laughable, but you know, obviously, again, we know the F-104 based on your discussion today so far, thank you. And so you could argue that a weakness is BFMing, But again, it wasn't really designed to do that. So as I was thinking about what you said, Rob, I'll take a guess at this and then you can tell me. But for strengths and weaknesses, I wrote down stability, especially down low and turning. So am I close or was there ever anything that you really loved and one thing you really hated that you want to share apart from those or maybe those were it? Well, um, I didn't know any better. So there's nothing I hated. Okay. But love was the airplane would do what you wanted it to Once you figured out how to fly it, the airplane was very, very, in my opinion, very, very honest and extremely stable down low. So day in, day out, up in the weapons range at Cold Lake or down for a red flag, easy to fly it at 100 feet. We cruised always at 450 knots and then from the IP into the target. So from a point about 10 miles, 15 miles back from the target where we start to get serious about getting weapons on target. That was always 540 knots. So 450, 540 knots, hundred feet, 50 feet, not difficult to do at all on that aircraft. Europe politically were, we were restricted to 500 feet above the ground, except in some low fly areas. Bavaria had one where we were cleared down to 250 feet. We're flying VFR with a stopwatch, a map and a compass. So we didn't have any technology, no moving maps, nearly days. <laughs> In the early days, get this, the LN3, that's the inertial navigation system in the aircraft. Uh If it had a six-mile terminal error when you landed 
that was fantastic. It didn't seem to get better than that. Oh, wow. It kept you very honest with your map in your hand, stopwatch, flying an airspeed, and flying very low. You got very, very good, especially Europe is notorious in the wintertime for poor VFR, especially in the northern part of Europe. We got very good at flying around at three miles viz. Wow. So it's a comfort factor. So the strength, it's stability. You could not do that. Again, just mm-hmm. back up. I'm not talking about going through the Rocky Mountains here, low level. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about undulated, but fairly flat land. Easy, easy to fly it down at 100 feet, 540 knots, three miles viz. You get really used to doing that. <laughs> that sounds crazy to me. But again, you wouldn't just jump in and do it for the first time. You would build up to that through training and ready room discussions. So, okay, that makes sense. When I talk about weaknesses, I guess what I ask is if, was there ever something you just wish they would have fixed or something that was kind of a nuisance to you? But again, we've talked about the uh, maneuvering. So if that's sufficient, we can keep it at that. Well, I seem to have more than my share of hydraulic problems. That was just, you know, sometimes there's a Charlie Brown character that's always got a cloud over his head. I can't think of his name right now. The problem with me was I didn't realize what we were missing till I did my first F-18 trip. And then it was like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. You can turn. I couldn't fly the F-18 as low and as fast, as comfortable as I did the 104, but it did everything else. And it wasn't until I got to the F-18 that I realized, wow, we missed a whole bunch of generations here from the 104 to the F-18 as we stepped along. Right. Then I realized, oh gosh, um, it can turn. It's got all these delightful weapons. It's got all this technology that helps you including an, an INS or an IRS, can't remember what we called it in that airplane, and moving map. And it was like, wow, these things would have really helped the 104, but I didn't know it at the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's suitable, right? When you start flying something, as you said earlier, that's the first thing you know, so you just go with it. Yeah, that's um, right. Far from a brand new pilot to sit and shake his fists at the uh, squadron and everyone else, hey, how come it doesn't have this or that? But it's easy with hindsight when you look at the F-18, which I agree with the INS, and then later the GPS-aided makes it uh, almost idiot-proof. But to your point, when I first was training in the A-4 in flight school, we still did strip charts in low levels with points of reference and headings and time and dead reckoning. So that's what makes a good pilot. And the final thing, the 104 was fast, but it also needed to be fast on the runway and fast on approach. And so again, when I got to the F-18 and it was like, I'm just, I think it was like 126 knots plus gas. If you didn't have the uh, alpha indicator on final. That's right. So we'll say 130 knot final approach speed on an F-18. Well, ho. Oh, the old 104 there, you cross the final approach fix usually at 245 wow. and started decelerating down. And if you had flap problems, my gosh, it was 295 knots plus gas for a flapless. Your brain speeds up, your mind speeds up, and you just think that's normal. And then you get an F-18, and oh boy, you've got forever as you're coming down the final approach. <laughs> yeah. Because you're going so slow. Were the landing gear, were they bouncy or was it easy to make a firm landing? Oh, no, it's very easy. In fact, there's not much clearance with the wing tip tanks. And so you really, there's none of this um, forward slip cross controlling, whatnot on a crosswind. You landed Mm -hmm. and the landing gear was quite far aft. The CAG was very forward of the landing gear and it straightened itself out. The landing gear was very, very forgiving. And of course, like all the Century Series airplanes, uh, it's a drag shoot on every landing unless you got more than 10,000 feet of runway. And if there was any contaminant, you needed the drag shoot. Oh, gosh. To dissipate the energy. But the landing was easy. And it, once again, it's just, you just got used to these crazy speeds. It's like right. the rotate speed on takeoff for a normal configured 104 was 212 knots. So you trundled down the runway to 212 knots and then fed some aft stick in. You just get used to that stuff. Anybody will get used to it if you train for it. That's right. Like most things. I mean, I, I look at musicians and think, how on earth do they do that? But they don't just pick it up and start doing it. They train and practice and rehearse. So good point. All right, Rob, where would the listener have seen the F-104? I mean, it's a very iconic shape. Was it in Hollywood? Did it have its day in the movies or was it on a flight demonstration team? Well, there were several demonstration teams, but all the ones, except for those starfighters that you were talking about making the air show circuit, mm-hmm. us Canadians, we had a air demonstration team, but it was in Europe. And so you'll find most of your starfighter air demonstration would be in Europe. If anybody lived in the Europe through the seventies to the mid eighties, they would have seen 104s 
flying around with great abandon. But I think the classic, classic place is uh, Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff, that was made into a movie. Mm. At the very end, when um, Chuck Yeager tries to break the altitude record, spins, ejects, has that little fire that's going on in his uh, helmet, that's a 104. Right. Well, speaking of him, as you and I are recording this, he just passed away a couple of days ago. So obviously the loss of a huge aviation legend. But yeah, I do remember that part. I always thought it was funny because, you know, they show him flying so high and so fast and then he has this problem and he ejects and lo and behold, here comes the truck, you know, trundling along at 15 miles per hour. And I thought, <laughs> how can he do it? <laughs> it's right there. But again, Hollywood can't always have the reality of uh, what we deal with because it just wouldn't be as compelling. But anyway, so yeah, the F-104 has definitely made its rounds and uh, I guess beloved by some, but like you said, didn't last very long in the U.S. Air Force at least. I did read, and I was surprised to read this, that it flew over 5,000 missions in Vietnam. For some reason, I never knew that. Yes. I used to remember the story, and I'm sorry I don't as to why it was deployed, but I think it was because they had them that they used them <laughs> more than they really, really well, that makes sense. Yeah, more yeah. than they really wanted them. Yeah. I read that they didn't get any air-to-air -air kills, and they did lose about 14 of them. So maybe... I think there was uh, some base. To, where did I read? I forget already. But yeah, they sent them over, and I, I guess they were moderately effective, shall we say? Again, I mentioned that earlier. They're a great air to air machine if somebody gets in front of you. Yeah, that makes sense. I read that they used them as combat air patrol to guard the uh, EC 121s, I believe it was. So they found a role for those guys. Well, as you think back to your 950 ish hours in the F 104, Rob, is there a particular flight or mission that stands out in your memory? Well, I've got a, about 30 stories about my time in the 104, and as my career goes forward, I have less and less and less stories, and I, I ended up my career with Air Canada, I just retired, and where there's really no stories. So That's good. All of my stories seem to happen either in the CF-5, the motors quit in that airplane all the time in the cold weather, or in the 104. We talked a little bit about the CRV-7. I do remember one day, I was um, scheduled to go and do a rocket delivery. I believe it was Prince Philip. Somebody royal was in Canada doing a tour, and we were to do a firepower demonstration. I remember gee, it was pretty cool. We were going to have uh, 100 out of these CRV-7 rockets out at the range to do a firepower demonstration. Nice. And boy, I took off, and the number one hydraulic system dumped all its hydraulic fluid. There's two. The number one does everything. The number two hydraulic system just does flight controls. Okay. Okay. I've lost mostly everything. And I thought, I've never shot a hundred of these CRV-7 rockets at once. That's going to be really, really a cool experience. I can't wait. Oh, geez. I'm down. I'm missing a hydraulic system. Geez, I should declare an emergency. What's my wingman going to do? And I thought, geez, I've never fired these rockets. And then I thought, my luck will be just before I press the pickle button to fire the rockets, the other hydraulic system will give out. The airplane will swing around and I'll fire them all off at the Prince. Uh, that'll get me in hot water. <laughs> so I went back and landed with hot rockets. It seems we were doing that a lot. Taking off um, one time that 212 aft stick speed. So you'd trundle down the runway. I'd full load of Mark 82s on. Rotate the stick back so the aircraft nose starts coming up. You check forward to hold it in that attitude. And the pitch froze. Uh, I couldn't adjust pitch oh. on the aircraft. So once again, you come back in, land the aircraft on pitch trim, electric pitch trim. But again, you got the live weapons. I, my heart goes out to those armorers that it seems to me we brought live weapons home a lot in training. Oh, yeah. That always stinks. And those guys that have to walk around those rockets and rearm them and walk around those live bombs and, and rearm them because you've come home and you're sitting there with, you've obviously used the drag chute because you're full of fuel. You've taken the cable and you probably have blown both tires with hot brakes. My hat goes off to those armorer guys that walk around and safe up all the weapons. So all of my problems, thank you armorers for being so brave and safing up my airplane. Here, here. All right. Well, we'll dedicate this episode to the armorers, as you say, or the ordnance men, all the folks that work with the weapons. So good stuff, Rob. All right. Did you ever later get a chance to fire that many rockets? I'm guessing not. No, I didn't. No, that's sad. Uh, the Royals went away and that was the end of my 10 seconds <laughs> of fame or whatever you get. Well, it's funny you say that because I look back at my career and I also have had times where I thought, mm, I can make it. 
or right, or I can keep going, or I can do this. And then there's always, right, it's the little, the devil and the angel on your shoulders. And the first one to speak up, at least in my airplane, was always the devil, right? Like, oh, you'll be fine. Keep going. And invariably said, no, no, it's the right thing. You know, go back and land. And I guess in the end, I imagine you will agree, is as much fun as that would have been to fire 100 rockets, you probably have a lot more fun in the aggregate continuing to fly after that because you didn't <laughs> complain, right? That you kept flying when you had one hydraulic system or whatever you might have done. And that's usually what kept me going. Yes. Yeah. Oh, boy. All right. So you're also retired twice from Air Canada as well. Boy, I should have had you and Stace on at the same time. You guys have very parallel stories here. Did you know him? Yeah, and we're good friends. Oh, <laughs> I should have asked you that earlier. All right, fantastic. Well, I'll just send a, a single package of thank you cards and you can give him to his if you would, because yeah. uh, I'm old fashioned and I like to send those to my guests. So I'll ask for your address when we're done here in a moment, but that's great. I should have connected the dots sooner on that, but all right. So this has been a lot of fun, Flecko, and uh, we're just about done. So he's playing hockey in his retirement, but he's got his grandkids and he didn't like the idea of a rocking chair. So let me ask you, what's the future hole for you? What are you doing in your retirement? So far, COVID has put a ah. bit of a damper on my retirement, but okay, I've always flown and I have an RV8 that's an amateur built tandem aircraft. Ah. I was just out doing aerobatics in it yesterday. So my plan is to relive my youth and go out there and fly a bunch of aerobatics in my RV8. That's not a bad plan. I like that. <laughs> All right. And our standard last question, and I'm going to take a stab at this. So Rob Fleck. Flecko. Hmm. Not too imaginative, but what was that the deal back in the day was just take someone's name and give it a little twist of some sort? Well, yes. You just talked with Stace and his last name Stacy. So not very imaginative. <laughs> he lost a letter and you gained a letter. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, so net zero between the two of you. All right. But he did go to great lengths, unprovoked, I might say, to say that uh, he never had anything else stick, although he should have. So how about you? Any skeletons in the closet that could have ended up in a, a different call sign? <laughs> you want me to say that on your show? Well, I can hit stop here and we can have it off. Okay, look, I've hit stop. So go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. It's still recording. <laughs> no, no, Vincent. I seem to have had um, more than my share of close calls, especially when I was younger, but as elaborate as things came, no, there's no dancing around with underwear on your head. There's none of those things. I, I guess I was too young to know to do that, to make myself famous. Well, you didn't do it or you didn't get caught because thankfully I just didn't get caught. <laughs> the whole run just didn't get caught. <laughs> And nobody picked up on it. See, cell phones were not as, and cameras, more importantly, were not as ubiquitous back then as they are now. So, uh, yeah. we're not recording right now, right, Vincent? Uh, no, we still are, actually. Okay. Well, there's things that are inappropriate for a family show. The classic was my squadron on the 104. Uh, the Canadians from the early part of the Second World War were given 400 to 450. So, all our squadrons right. are in that grouping. And I was on 4 2 one squadron. Okay. They were called the Red Indians. It would be terribly inappropriate these days to go around with a patch on your shoulder that talks about the Red Indians, at least up here in Canada. So I see a society has changed quite a bit oh, yes. in that what was appropriate as far as alcohol, what was appropriate as far as what guys did, and what was appropriate even legally sanctioned, 421 Red Indian Squadron, which is stood down right now, it's dormant. Our society has changed so much that things that we did and took for normal in the 70s and 80s, uh, and rightly so, are not appropriate now. Yeah. And without going on too much of a tangent, is it a shame? Maybe in a sense. I mean, some boys need to be boys, but on the other hand, a lot of it was destructive, frankly. And so without suggesting a referendum on behavior in the 70s and 80s. And I think of, at least in the States, the F-14 community, they were pretty notorious for that kind of thing. It's it's a bygone era and probably best to leave it at that. So mm -hmm. anyway, Fleco, well, this has been a lot of fun. I want to thank you for your time. I know I took you away from your busy retirement there. So <laughs> no, this has been great. I really appreciate you helping us learn all about the F-104 today. Well, Vincent, I appreciate being able to share a passion and a love of an airplane. And thank you very much for having me on. All right, man, these Canadians are such affable guys. Thanks again to Flecko for taking the time today. Bruce, what did you think of that interview? I thought that was a lot of fun. I thought it was a lot of fun, too. <laughs> I was interested in what he had to say, and they were wondering why 
the F-104 was chosen by so many air forces, and one he didn't mention was cost. Okay. Cost. Cost. Yeah. Every economy has to have so much in their defense budget, and they want a lot of Mach 2 fighters, and you could get almost three F-104s for the cost of one F-106. I see. So if you want to put a lot of Mach 2 fighters in your Air Force and you haven't got much money, go for the 104. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And speaking of that, as we said at the top, I learned after this interview that there are still F-104s flying around today. In fact, there is a special company that flies them at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, and they perform various missions. And uh, those were the guys that apparently used to go do the air show circuit, but they don't do it anymore. Now they do specialized testing for the FAA and NASA. And I think that's pretty cool. Oh, that's great. I hadn't heard of that. Yeah, they have, I think, 10 of them. They're about to put two in uh, a museum somewhere, so they're going to go down to eight. But yep, we talked to them, and in the end, we thought about having them on the show, but there's not much we can do for them as far as you can't just go pay for a ride, and uh, you know they can't do much for us as far as we've got the information. So anyway, it's good to know that they're out there. But I need to ask you this, though, Bruce. Who, how, why? I don't know what to ask, but the idea of downward ejection seats, that just seems crazy. Well... Actually, it was an essential thing that why it was put in there, because at that time, the ejection seats we had wouldn't throw you up over that high tail with the rudder on it, the high flying stabilizer. Ah. Our ejection seats at the speeds he was talking about, it would have cut the pilot in ribbons. Oof. So the only way to get him out safely was to downward eject. So Kelly Johnson put in the downward eject. And then ejection seats improved, and we went to rockets and things like that. Then we could get him out over the tail, and then we went to vertical ejection. I see. So it was actually uh, actually to get watch out for that doggone tail. You don't want to be sliced by that thing. <laughs> No, but obviously that then negates the ability to eject in a landing or takeoff emergency. And I guess that was just the price they paid in those early days, huh? Yes. Well, a couple of pilots at Kinchelow Air Force Base was named after Kinchelow. He was killed ejecting from a 104 at low altitude on takeoff. And some of the others tried rolling upside down so that they'd be ejecting upwards to get away from it. But that downward ejection seat. Wow was a killer. Mm, I can imagine. Well, I do want to come back to one thing I said somewhat erroneously. I said something about most aircraft carry most of their fuel in the wings. And I think maybe I should have said some or partial, and I'm sure there's exceptions, but in fact, a lot of times the fuselage is where most of the fuel is carried. And in the case of the 1L4, it's where all the fuel is carried. Well, compared to the F-106, where most of it was carried in the Delta wing. We had a huge amount of fuel in the Delta wing, and he had none in his wing. All he had was a little fuselage tank. The 104s were running out of fuel all the time, and so they had always had to fly with their drop tanks. So they had two drop tanks, but they wanted to go real fast with them, so they were small. An F-106 drop tank carried more than twice as much fuel as the uh, F-104 drop tanks. Okay. So the result is my favorite plane, the 106, had lots more time rotoring, and the F-104 could go fast, but it couldn't hang around to talk about it. <laughs> no. Well, as we said, airplanes are always trade-offs, and so you get something, you give something up. All right. Well, Bruce, I have to admit, I foolishly forgot Ernest Hemingway's famous quote about loving your first aircraft. And we talked about it on episode 101. We talked about it here on episode 104. And it's a great little paragraph. It's almost a poem. And I think we'll read it at the very end of this episode. So stick around to after the flyby and I'll read this for you. But anyone who follows military aviation has probably heard it. I should have remembered that as we kept touching on how you love your first fighter. 
our wives were jealous of our airplanes because <laughs> they knew where our first love was. <laughs> Yes. Bruce, what about those final approach fix speeds, the approach speeds in general coming over the fence? Flecko was talking about some ridiculous numbers, and I'm not saying he's wrong. I just, I can't imagine that. Oh, I couldn't either. I, I was always worried about blowing tires, and I'm amazed that they didn't blow tires landing at those speeds or taking off. The greatest strain on your plane, on the 106 anyway, was at the point of rotation where you're rotating the nose and the weight is still on the gear and you're reaching the highest speed. That's the most critical time. And I thought we were having troubles with speed and think of the 104 going that much faster. My golly, I don't know who built their tires, but those are good tires. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. All right. We also missed some notoriety. Apparently, there is a movie from 1964 called The Starfighters. Da -da -da. And uh, Robert Dornan, Shirley Olmsted, not sure who they are, but apparently they starred in it. I don't remember that movie. I haven't seen it. Did you like it, Bruce? I didn't get to see it. No, I didn't. All right. Maybe that was one of those mystery science type movies that nobody ever uh, really watched, but I don't know. Anyway, all right. Flecko and I spontaneously dedicated this episode to all the armorers and ordnance folks out there. Oh, yeah. uh, what do you think, Bruce? I bet you have a lot of respect for those young people. Oh, yes. They worked hard. It was dangerous. I have a great photo I took of the guy in Vietnam. This guy was a real specimen of American manhood, and he's cranking on the fuses on the bombs. And I'm saying, that's an American for you. That's someone you can stand up to. And, and uh, I've put out his picture in a number of places. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And it was always a bummer when you brought it back. Yeah. It was a complex job. We could talk about fusing for a long time. <laughs> Oh, yes. I have an article on our website under our musings that talks about fusing a little bit and proximity fuses and all the different electronics that go into that. But mm. yeah, maybe sometime. In fact, you're going to be back for episode 106, so maybe we can do it then. But what else do we need to know today about the F-104, Bruce? Well, may I tell a certain war story? I'd love to tell one. <laughs> of course. That's why you're here. <laughs> well, in 1967, they set up a program to see what supersonic air combat could be like. And they sent four of us in 106s down to Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. We were scheduled to fly against some F-104s. There were a lot of criteria they set up. Actually, it gave the advantage to the 104s. But the whole thing was to get a supersonic battle. What is a supersonic dogfight going to look like? So they had some F-101s coming in as targets at low altitude, coming in as fast as the 101s could go. 106s were supposed to cover them, four 106s, and four F-104s were to attack, and we were to defend. So... Uh, we went out in the area. Of course, as we came in, we were coming in. We were about 20,000 feet intermediate altitude. We were given no information about the 104s, where they were, anything else. But they got all the information about us. So <laughs> we knew that the first time we would see them was they'd be behind us, closing as supersonic. Okay. So our speed going in was about... Uh, Mach 0.97. I was coming in. I saw 104 look behind me all the time, had a shrivel, coming in fast. I saw him, so I broke a hard left, and of course, he couldn't match my turn. And so he overshot me, and I rolled around. I was on his tail, and I'm going in full afterburner to catch this guy, and he was diving away from me. Now, I locked onto him with radar which we had in the 106 really good, and it showed me immediately that he was running away from me at more than 200 miles an hour. He was diving down, and I'm going down. I got up to about Mach 1.5 going down after this guy, and he's still going away from me. So those 104s were fast. But then <laughs> the pilot made a mistake. Now, 
Flint told you how big a loop it made. He said 14,000 feet, I believe, to make a loop up. Right. Of course, an Immelman is just a half a loop, and he rolls out on the top of it. So I'm coming down with my radar on this guy. I can't see him anymore. I mean, he's gone, but I've got radar. <laughs> and suddenly my steering dot starts from the bottom and starts going up. That guy's climbing on me. He's coming back to fight. He was doing an Immelman, pulling up hard into this half loop. And I came in and I got him as he was pulling halfway through his loop because I had lead computing missiles and all that. I got him, but he was coming into the back loop. Now, that showed a number of things about the 104 that is the reason for this. First of all, we did not see him coming in on our radar. Fleck called about how low a radar cross-section they had. Right. So they got through our F-106's radar. I did not pick them up. Any other plane, I would have. This was maybe the beginning of what you would call stealth. (laughs) That's right. They were not picked up. We didn't pick them up until we saw them coming in behind us. And next of all was the extreme speed. Fleck talked about the F-104s being used for nuclear attack down low in Europe. Mm -hmm. People say, you know, that doesn't sound very smart. But really, he then said what speed he was coming in. He said that he had the F-104 up to 750 knots, if you remember. And the 106 doesn't go that fast. I have never had the 106 over 550 knots indicated. Mm -hmm. He said that he would travel 550 knots with weapons on board. So no wonder they use these guys for low altitude attack. Nobody could catch them. (laughs) So that's my 104 story. They were cheap. They were fast. Oh, and by the way, in one of my engagements with them, again, these supersonic engagements. Most of the problems with the 104 turning is at subsonic speeds, where anybody could outturn a 104. But if you got it up like we did and engaged them, I did on one of the engagements, at about Mach 1.5, the 104 can really turn well at Mach 1.5. And don't Hmm. underrate the F-104 for a supersonic turn. (laughs) Well, Bruce, you are a piece of work, sir. (laughs) Thank you for that story. And uh, the final thoughts there on the F-104, boy, uh, (laughs) I'm really looking forward to the F-106 because that's going to feature you as the guest, not just the co-host. We'll get to that in a little bit, but at any rate, all right, well, we've been having fun here for a long time, and unfortunately, everything has got to come to an end eventually, so we can begin to transition to wrapping up now. We do want to thank our new Patreon strike leads, Blaine Hodge and Matthew Whitaker. We also have a new mission commander, Chris Rabe. Uh, he's actually not new. He was with us before, but he had to bail for a while, and he's back. So thank you, Chris, and everyone else. And we have a new air boss, Linda Gardner. As always, the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the host's and our guest, and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components, or I presume the Canadian Armed Forces as well. Bruce, you need a break next week, or do you want to come back and talk about the F-105? You've been at it pretty steadily. I had five of my friends going over in the F-105 to Vietnam. Only one of them didn't get shot down. Goodness. Three of them got killed, and one of them spent his time in Hanoi Hilton. And so the 105 has touches me too much. So um, I really would rather pass on the 105. Thanks for the offer, but uh, all right. it's an emotional one. I totally get it, but that's all right. Why don't you take the time to prepare for the F-106, and we'll catch you on episode 106. So uh, do appreciate you stopping by, as always, Bruce. For everyone else, once again, happy Valentine's Day. Now get out there and do something unexpected and delightful for somebody you love. And we'll see you all back here next time on episode 105 of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? 
Email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening. You love a lot of things if you live around them, but there isn't any woman and there isn't any horse, nor any before nor any after, that is as lovely as a great airplane. And men who love them are faithful to them even though they leave them for others. A man has only one virginity to lose in fighters, and if it is a lovely plane he loses it to, there his heart will ever be. Ernest Hemingway.